Good morning and welcome. My name is Andy Hillman, and it's my privilege this morning to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you, including those who are watching with us on Zoom as we come together this morning to worship God. I want to especially welcome any who are here today for the first time, those maybe who are just visiting. Special welcome to you and a reminder that uh, join us afterwards for tea and coffee. If you have a cell phone with you, can I ask that you just check it and make sure that it's either off or on silent. We're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper during the service this morning. So I'm just going to remind those who are online to make their preparations in order to be able to join us shortly. I must say, I'm, we're delighted to have Richard Sturdy back with us, having recovered from COVID. Richard, we thank the Lord for your recovery, and we look forward to you sharing your message from God's word with us this morning. Today is a special day in the church calendar. It's Pentecost Sunday, or Whit Sunday, as it used to be known, when traditionally women and children used to come to worship all dressed in white. The Jewish feast of Pentecost was held 50 days after the Passover, and it was on that Pentecost Sunday, some 10 days after Jesus' ascension, that God poured out the promised Holy Spirit on that group of early believers in Jerusalem, and the church was born. At the Last Supper, Jesus, who had spoken to his disciples, promising the Holy Spirit, said, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, and he lives with you and will be in you. Let's pray together as we come to worship. Our loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this opportunity to gather together in your on your day to worship you. That is what we want to do. Won't you take away all the distracting thoughts from our minds of the week behind us and all the concerns and cares of the world around us and enable us to worship you as we ought. As you filled that room in Jerusalem with the Holy Spirit, won't you fill this place now with your Holy Spirit that we might leave this morning changed, challenged, and encouraged to follow you more closely and to serve you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my favorite hymns originated from Ireland in the 8th century. Be thou my vision. Let's stand and sing this beautiful hymn and make the words our prayer today. <laughs>
seated. Just a few announcements this morning. The first one concerns a welcome tea that we're holding next Sunday morning after the service. And it's a special tea for those who are new or newish. We encourage you, won't you all join next Sunday morning after the service. Join Andy on a Monday morning at 10 or a Wednesday evening at 7 here in the church or online for his series that answers the question, what is the best future that you could ever imagine? Richard leads the Bible study at the Schoenfeld's home in Amber Valley on a Wednesday evening at 7, which is also on Zoom. I invite you to join us um, in Amber Valley, but 2.30 on a Wednesday afternoon in a new series in John's Gospel entitled Light of the World. Do please keep our June missionaries, Greg and Yvonne Cameron, in your prayers. They are serving the Lord in Paraguay. I'm very humbled to have been asked to, to uh, lead in the celebration of communion with you all. And do hope that nobody will be offended because it is not Andy or Richard. And is preaching away today in Hillcrest, and uh, Richard is bringing us God's word a little later on. In this church, of course, for benefit of newcomers, we, knew we use juice in place of wine for what we hope will be quite obvious reasons. And uh, another little prompt for you folks out there on the internet uh, to have something ready later on. I welcome everybody, regulars and visitors alike, both here and on Zoom, uh, to celebrate communion with us this morning. Neither God nor we care what denomination you're from. However, if you do have an unresolved problem with your fellow brother or sister, or haven't yet surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, or cannot agree wholeheartedly with what the uh, the words of the creed, which we'll be saying shortly, then please pass bread and juice on. No one will think the worse of you. And should such be the case, and you would like to talk to Richard or myself about such issues after the service, we'd be very happy to chat to you over tea or coffee. The scriptures warn us that to participate in the Lord's Supper with a wrong heart brings God's judgment on us. And please remember that there's nothing magical about the elements of communion. They remain bread and juice. What is most important that we remember what those elements represent, which is the body and blood of Christ. The commemoration of the Last Supper was indeed an injunction from Christ himself. It is to be celebrated regularly, but not slavishly, lest we become dulled by doing it too frequently. Let us still our minds and bow our heads whilst I pray. This is a prayer which may be familiar in some respects, and I've altered it slightly. Almighty God, you know us better than we know ourselves. Our hearts are open books. You know the desires of all our hearts, and under your gaze we have no secrets. Cleanse our thoughts and purify our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that wonderful gift from you, the sending of which to the faithful we especially remember this Sunday of Pentecost. We ask, Lord, we ask this, Lord, so that we might love you more purely and more deeply to the honour and glory of your holy name. In the name of the Lamb, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. Let us all stand and say together the Apostles' Creed.
I believe in one God, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, he died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he should come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Christ's holy universal church, the fellowship of Christians, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Will the stewards please come forward and uh, prepare to serve the, the bread and juice. I have slightly changed the words of the blessings as I do not wish anyone to think that there's anything particularly special about me. When you have the bread and juice, please hold on to it till all have been served. And the stewards have returned to the table and then we will partake together. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ which was given for us, preserve our body and soul to everlasting life. Let us take and eat this bread in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our heart by faith with thanksgiving. Could I ask you to bow, bow your head? And let us pray this prayer of humble access now. Merciful Lord, we do not dare to come to your table, trusting in our own righteousness, but only in your great mercy. Without your gracious forgiveness, we are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table. But the finished work of redemption by your dear son, Jesus Christ, has made us fit to be welcomed into your presence. Grant, therefore, that as we eat and drink, we may by faith remember the body and blood of your dear son, Jesus Christ. And you ask that as we do this, we may be united to him and he to us. Thank you. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for us, preserve our body and soul to everlasting life. Drink this juice in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for us, and let us be thankful. Almighty God, in your graciousness and mercy, you have forgiven us all our sins, because in faith we believe that Jesus Christ, the sacrificial lamb, has paid the price that our sins deserved instead of us. What an awesome gift. Thank you, Lord God. In the precious name of Christ, your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Amen. Friends, we have a collection box at the door, and as it is communion, of course, the uh, Care Fund collection box is there also um, for any contributions that you're able to make. The Care Fund is kept separate from normal giving and is discretionary money uh, to help those who may be experiencing any particular financial difficulties. Just want to say a big thank you to all those who prepare communion and, and uh, clear up afterwards each month and also the, to the stewards too. It's much appreciated. I'm very sorry, but you've got to continue to listen to my voice a little longer because it is my privilege to do prayers now. The lessons will follow, read by Rosemary Horton and Liz Kasuth. And then Richard will bring us God's word. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Heavenly Father, be merciful to us and hear the prayers which we humbly bring to you this morning, mindful that it is Pentecost, a time when Jesus sent the promised counselor, the Holy Spirit, the gift which gave great courage to your disciples and faithful followers. In this dark world, please bestow upon us that same courage and faith to make, for the sake of the gospel, 
and the future of your church. We pray too for the Camerons, people of Howick who strive to spend, spread the, your word in a region of Paraguay, a place where much of your word has been so distorted. Give them strength and wisdom to be strong, gracious and compassionate in the spreading of the true gospel in the name of Christ. We thank you for all who are present here today with us, both on Zoom or YouTube connections. Thank you that we can use such technology to be united as a family in praise and worship of you. But challenge us by your spirit, please, not to abuse this technology to suit our own convenience. Father, we thank you for the messages of continual encouragement to us who believe. You hear our prayers, and in faith, we ask that you would comfort any who are grieving, are sick in mind or body, are distressed spiritually or materially, or are lonely, remembering particularly those who do not know you. Let's just pause for a moment to bring to mind some people we may know who fit those categories. Lord, through your spirit, please restore and comfort those so distressed and help us to be mindful of their needs so that we may give the help, comfort, guidance or gospel as needed. Heavenly Father, this country still bleeds because those charged to lead us do so out of motives of selfish ambition and greed rather than service to the people they were elected to serve. We are mindful of what the scriptures tell us about those in authority over us, Father, but many are tempted to stray from being good citizens because of the bad, bad example that they see in some of those authorities. We appeal to your Holy Spirit to convict those who misuse their powers in greed and corruption. Give them contrite hearts. May they repent of their wickedness so that we may have leaders with a servant heart. And Lord, we pray for our authorities who do have servant hearts and serve faithfully and ask that you would use them to rule and govern us wisely and quietly for the benefit of all the peoples of South Africa. Heavenly Father, you have called us to be active members of Christ's church, especially here in our Howick Fellowship. Bless the fellowship of all within reach, our bishops, ministers, and others with kingdom responsibilities. Give us all guidance and wisdom to grow your church by graciously telling others about Christ and the wonderful salvation he has won for us through Calvary's cross. Grant to all Christian fellowships around the world, wherever your true gospel is faithfully preached, sure faith in your holy word and lives obedient to it. Omnipotent God, we pray for our church fellowship here in Howick. Continue to give wisdom, strength, and grace to our leaders, Andy and Richard, the church council, and all others with ministries in this church. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would continue to bring people forward to make themselves available to help in some way in the ministries of this church. We pray for all the church activities, especially the Bible fellowships groups and their leaders. We ask that through the Holy Spirit, they would be, they would be, in, more would be encouraged to join these groups and help us all continually to encourage others to join us, to explore your holy word together in Christian fellowship. Lord, hear our prayers and let our cries come to you. Mercifully grant our requests as are most expedient for us and forgive us our sins. Help us to turn from our wickedness to serve you better. And all this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. The, the first reading comes to us from Malachi chapter 1, and we're reading from verses 1 to 5. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I, I have turned his hill country into a wasteland 
and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the, the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of Israel. Thanks be to the Lord for his word. The New Testament reading this morning is from John chapter 5, verses 16 to 27. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. <clears throat> Jesus gave them this answer, very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For well, the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. For just as the father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son that all may honor the son, just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, and he has given him authority to judge, because he is the Son of Man. Let's pray. Father, quieten our hearts that we may hear your word, hear what you have to say, take our thoughts beyond the preacher to your word and to your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that those who need encouragement would be encouraged, and those who need to be challenged would be challenged. In Jesus' name, amen. This person on the slide his name is Conrad Schumann. He, at the time, was 19 years of age. He was an East German border policeman. It's April 1961. The Berlin Wall was going up. The border was closing. It would remain closed for 28 years until November 1989. He leapt over the barbed wire at the last moment that divided the two Berlins. It's quite interesting how it came to happen. He, did, he hadn't planned it. He was there on duty, and he saw a woman from the western side pass a flower over the wall to her older mother on the eastern side. And the two of them looked at him, and they pointed to him, and they said, that's our jailer. And he felt he could not live the rest of his life in that role, so he jumped the wall and escaped. Later, he said it was all over in three seconds. And that photo, by the way, is iconic of the Berlin Wall. Before he jumped, he was in effect a prisoner. He was trapped in East Germany. Three seconds later, he was a free man. The change was absolute, the change was sudden, the change was complete. Now, when we become Christians, and nobody's born a Christian, we all have to become a Christian, the change in our situation is just as absolute and just as decisive. Before, we were unsaved. We were lost. We had no relationship with the Lord. 
we were children of wrath. After we were saved, we were forgiven, adopted as God's children, we had eternal life. Our fortunes had changed from the very worst to the very best, and that in a moment. And now all that comes with being a Christian is now mine. I can lay claim to every promise that God gives to the believer, and I can look to the cross and I can say, on that cross, Jesus died for my sins. So today we're asking three questions about that tipping moment in our life. I'll leap over the spiritual wall, as it were. First question, when do I know I've arrived? When can I say with confidence that I am saved? And then the second question, how did I get there? And the third question, who did it? So we're going to look at it through just one verse, John 5, 24. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. But of course, we have to look at that verse as we always do a scripture in its greater context and in the context of John's gospel. I guess most of us are familiar with John's prologue. In it, he gives the reader an overview of Jesus and his ministry. He, te he tells us that Jesus was God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He tells us that Jesus is our creator. Through him, all things were made. He tells us that Jesus was rejected. His own did not receive him. But here's the promise. To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, we, the reader, as we read through John's Gospel, we know this because John has told us this right in his introduction. But apart from Jesus, none of the other characters that we meet in the book actually do know that. And John takes us on a journey of discovery. We see how they respond to the gradual unveiling of Jesus' glory and as we do that, we see that there are, in fact, only two ways that we can respond to him. On the one hand, there's the growing realization of this, the, the disciples as the lights begin to come on for them. Yes, they were slow to learn. They were erratic, but they were getting there. Their hearts were right, and they were on a journey to, to, to believing in Jesus. And on the other hand, we see the growing hostility of the Jewish leaders as they are confronted by the claims that Jesus made. And our own insight is deepened as these people are, and as we see these people being exposed to Jesus' miracles, to his teaching and discipleship, to the conflict that seemed to accompany him wherever he went, and ultimately to his death and resurrection. Until at the end of the gospel, John reveals his purpose in writing it. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so it turns out that all along we have been in John's sights. We've seen the evidence. We've seen how some rejected and some were accepted. Now, says John, come down off the fence. I want you to believe as well. So back to our text. Very truly, I tell you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life. He will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. By the time Jesus said this, John has already exposed us to two of Jesus' important teachings. The first was our need for a radical conversion, a change of heart and mind that is driven by the Holy Spirit and we see that in Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Without that Holy Spirit-driven change, a new heart, without that we will never make sense of Christ's mission. And without it, we won't really know, we won't really want to know about Christ and his mission. So the first thing we take with us into it is our need for that spirit-driven, life-changing rebirth. And then we move on to the second thing. We have Jesus' mission is amplified to us. John 3.16, we know it very well. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, we have to understand as we look, look at this verse that nobody understood, except for Jesus, that he would be crucified. But what we are seeing here is that his mission to save us would be a sacrificial mission. God would give his son sacrificially. We also see that belief in Jesus will be crucial. We are all perishing. His sacrifices will change everything. Whoever believes must be saved. So we see the need for belief and the need for a, a Holy Spirit-driven radical change, radical conversion. The immediate context of our verse is a confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees, a confrontation which began when Jesus healed a paralytic on the Sabbath. Verse 18, for this reason they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Now, how did Jesus react to that? Well, did he say, oh, no, no, no. I'm so sorry I gave you that impression. Of course not. That would be blasphemy to claim, be claimed to be God. I am so, so sorry that you, you, I misled you in that way. Did he answer in that way? No, he didn't do that. He said just the opposite. If I can paraphrase it. He said, you've got it right. That is what I am claiming. I am one with God. He tells of the close and intimate relationship of love and submission within the Godhead. The father loves the son and shows him all he does. He tells of a shared authority and a commission from his father. For just as the father raises the dead and gives him life, so even the son gives life to whom he is pleased to give it. Moreover, the father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the son. We discover that Jesus speaks for his father. The son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what his he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. In other words, Jesus is saying, yes, the father am I, and I are one, and when I speak, the Father is speaking through me. If you believe what I am saying, <clears throat> you are believe. <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. You are believing the Father. If you don't believe what I'm saying, you are rejecting the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now, with that background, we're ready to look at our text. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. We're in salvation country. We're looking at the divinity of Jesus. We're listening to the voice of the Father through Jesus. And in our verse, we would expect to find those themes. We would expect to see them linked. And that is exactly what we see. So the truth that Jesus wants, wants us to believe is simply this, that he is the Christ, the divine son of God. That's what he's telling us, and that's what he wants us to hear, and that is what the Father wants us to hear. Jesus is the Christ. He is the divine son of God. It turns my world upside down. Our, our creator God has come to us in person as a human just as we are, and he comes on a mission to save us. Now, Jesus is not just ticking a box here. We need to understand that when he says believe, he's not ticking a box. Okay, got it. Tick it off. Pick up a T-shirt on the way out. He's not answering a question on East Coast Radio. Okay, says the presenter, for your next question, it's a difficult one, it's from the Bible. Who did Jesus say he was? Oh, I have to think about that. I think he said, if I'm right, I think he said that he was God. Is that your final answer? Yes, it's your final answer. Right, you've got it. That's exactly what he did claim. <clears throat> you've won yourself a brand new stainless steel toaster from game. That's not what he means by believing. If that's how we see it, then the truth of it just hasn't dawned on us. We know it, but we don't believe it. Believing is more like this. Jesus is God. 
Wow, now I see it. Why have I been so slow all these years not to see it? It's amazing. That's believing. It's a truth that will come back again and again. We will never cease to be amazed and mystified by it. We will glory in it. We will hold it close to our heart. It's precious to us. The man, Jesus, is Emmanuel, God with us, the divine son of God. You know, many people gave their lives rather than deny that truth. I hope that if I'm ever called to do that, I would do the same. Because it's true and it's important. Yes, Jesus, the man Jesus, is Emmanuel, God with us. And the happy state of those who believe, well, first, they have passed from death to life. You say, that's strange. I thought they were alive anyway. I thought life came before death. No, no. From birth, we were dead to spiritual things. We had no appetite for them. We didn't understand them. We wanted nothing to do with Jesus. And that unhappy state accurately reflected our relationship with God. It wasn't there. But that changed with the new birth. Now, instead of pushing Jesus away, I want him. Instead of rejecting his claim to be equal with God, I embrace it. I have passed from death to life. And that has important implications. It means, first of all, I will not be judged. God has already passed his judgment on me, and he finds me not guilty. And that is a judgment that will stand for eternity. And having been judged as not guilty, I have eternal life. I will live forever. After I die, I will be resurrected into a new and a perfect body. And here's the point. I will then live forever and ever in perfect harmony with Jesus and with his Father. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God incarnate. Believing that, I'm not going to be judged. Believing that, I have eternal life. So let's answer the questions we set out at the beginning. First, how can I know that I am saved? The answer, when I believe that Jesus is God incarnate. When I believe that he is Emmanuel, God with us. And I understand that he always has been God and he always will be God. Come to us in the flesh. When I believe that, I have passed from death to life. Like Conrad Schumann jumping from East Berlin to West Berlin, I have jumped in a moment from being lost to being saved. You may not have been aware of it. You, you may have had a Damascus Road conversion, in which case you probably were. You can probably place the moment when you were saved. You may have been awakened with a kiss, but there, there was a, and more slowly, but there was a moment, whether you were aware of it or not, when you passed from death to life, to eternal life, no judgment. And that was the moment at which you believed that Jesus was divine, the Son of God. How did I get there? Well, that's simple, isn't it? I heard and I believed. Well done, Richard. You heard, you believed. Good for you. Wait a minute. Wasn't I dead? And dead people can't bring themselves to life. You remember a few Sundays ago when uh, Glenn Lyons' was sermon preached to us? And he told us as a, how as a paramedic they had these paddles they put on somebody to revive them, push for the electric shock. And he said, never had he ever seen the patient grab the paddles and do it to himself. Dead people cannot bring themselves to life. So I could do nothing until I was raised from death to life. My faith, my belief, that wasn't my decision, even though it looked as though it was. It was, in fact, a gift from God. 
You see, in my spiritual grave, as it were, I couldn't believe. In my new life, I couldn't but believe. So who did it? The answer, God did it. The initiative was his. The decisive intervention was his. And I don't know about you, but I find that it's humbling. It's very humbling, but it's very, very reassuring. I did not choose him. He chose me. You see, if I chose him, I know myself, I might change my mind and lose it all. But he chose me, and he will never change his mind. I find that very, very comforting. Well, that's the theology. What happens when the rubber hits the road? Let's look at the application. First, let's ask the question, why is it so hard to believe? Why is it that I couldn't believe before I was born again? You see, in theory, it's so simple. All I have to do is listen to Jesus and believe what he says. And I'm there. I'm home and, gone, but home and dry. But unless I'm born again, I can't do it. it let me put you to the test. Maybe somebody came here today as a, as a convinced unbeliever. You came as a septic. You don't believe it. I'll give you a challenge. I'll count to 10. At the end of 10, you turn into a believer. You can't do it. And you know why you can't do it? Because you don't want to do it. That was our problem. We didn't want to take the knee for Christ. My problem with unbelief was not in the mind, although I made much of that and used that as an excuse. It was actually in the heart. I had a wicked, rebellious heart that couldn't bring itself to acknowledge that Jesus was the Christ. What if I do believe? What if I am convinced that Jesus is God incarnate? Well, then I have crossed from death to life. I'm saved. And every blessing that belongs to the Christian is mine. We have the right of prayer, the access to God. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living within us to guide us and to teach us. Everything that, is, that, that comes with being a Christian is now mine. I've crossed from death to life. I'm crossed from being, in God, being in, under God's wrath to being loved and adopted by God. If that's you, and I, I trust it's the majority of you, well, rejoice and give thanks to God. Go home rejoicing with a great and restful mind. And live out the rest of your life on this planet as a disciple of Jesus. And when you die, you'll go to heaven and you'll be with him. Now, just one more point and we've finished. What if I don't believe? What if I cannot say that Jesus is the divine son of God? Then I have to tell you, I'm lost. It doesn't matter how religious I am. It doesn't matter how long I've been coming to church. It doesn't matter how I serve in the church. It doesn't matter how I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I'm lost. I have no relationship with God apart from being the object of his wrath. I am still in my sins. And that puts me in a hole. because. I'm dead to God, and dead people can't save themselves. So what do I do? Well, maybe it doesn't trouble you. Maybe you came in an unbeliever, you can walk out an unbeliever, and you think, I'm, that's not for me. Well, you ought to, but your lack of interest just shows, it's just one more sign that you're dead. I can't help you. But what if it troubles you? What if you can see, I'm not there. I haven't believed. I'm not saved. And that troubles me because I don't want to be under, under God's wrath. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be right with God. Well, if it does that, that's encouraging because it is a suggestion in that that God has already begun to work in you, that the process of waking you up from the grave has already started. 
Don't relax. You're not home yet. You're not home until you believe. But the door is open. The way is there. You can't make yourself believe, but God can. And in Matthew 7, verse 7, Jesus gives an invitation. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. And if that's where you are, you stand on the cusp of becoming a Christian, well, I suggest you talk to Andy, you talk to myself, or talk to David, or to Andy, the other Andy, Andy who led the service. But better still, why don't you talk to Jesus yourself? So here, one more time, our text. Very truly I tell you, this is true. This is from, from I was going to say from the horse's mouth, but I won't say that. It's from the mouth of God the Father, speaking through his Son. Very truly I tell you that whoever hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Father, we thank you for the wonderful salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. And I ask that there will be nobody here today who would miss that. And I ask that those who are saved will go home rejoicing in the knowledge that they are right with you, thanks to the wonderful sacrifice of your divine Son, God incarnate, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Praise God for that. If you have the strength, can you help us to stack the chairs at the side ready for this evening? That would be a great help. And when you've done that, you can stay and have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. Thanks for being with us. God bless. Go home in peace.